Hello, everybody. Today is the 100th episode of the Psalm TV podcast, and I could not be more honored and our team could not be more proud that you guys are joining us. There was nobody out of anybody we have talked to or dealt with over the last decade that was more apt to be on the 100th episode than Ian Cobble from Psalm. Ian and I go back, geez, 13 something years. I don't know how many drinks and all sorts of stories. We're going to get into some really hilarious stuff on this podcast. This has been a long time coming. You're basically about to hear two old friends give each other a lot of shit and also get deep into the controversies of Psalm 1 and a number of other things. I'm telling you, this might be my favorite conversation I've ever had on this podcast. I cannot wait to hear what you guys think. I want to tell you, every episode of Sparklers, our cooking competition show, is now available to binge and stream on Psalm TV. This was a massive undertaking and... I just adore everybody who was involved in it. And I can't thank you enough for the outpouring and honestly, kind of uncomfortable love you guys have given to this show. It has uh, really been awesome. It's been awesome, but it has put me in an uncomfortable place. It looks like we're going to have to make a season two. And uh, that's, uh, it is what it is. I will drink more sparkling wine. Fine. Also, on February 15th, we release a very special film, Saving the Restaurant. We followed Master Smelly Bobby Stuckey for just about two years through the entire pandemic. And uh, this movie gets into some stuff that's hard, hard to understand unless you see it. If you work in the service industry, you lived it. Bobby ended up having to go through what most restaurants in the country did, shutting down restaurants, reopening them, dealing with staff that he doesn't know how to keep, dealing with supply chain issues. And this film sort of covers it all. And in battling Congress to uh, find some relief for restaurants across the country, it's really an amazing look. And uh, we are so honored. It is streaming exclusively on Psalm TV, February 15th worldwide. I would tell you about the screenings and the premieres, but they sold out immediately. So I'm not going to tell you about those. Go to psalmtv.com, $49.99 for an entire year. I promise you, it is worth it. All right, everybody, without further ado, my conversation with Mr. Cobble. So it's the 100th episode of the Psalm TV podcast. I mean, there's no, there's nobody else, and it's you. You have to be on this episode, and uh, you've never been on the Sound TV podcast. <laughs> there's, a, there's always a time. Thanks for having me, dude. I, you know, you and I go back. I'm trying to figure out what I want to start with is kind of what is your life like without me, and what is my life like without you? If you and I never I've met never, each other, I've never felt complete since uh, you left. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I, you know, I still feel really connected to you. Obviously, um, you know, the Psalm documentary, you know changed my life. You know, there was a lot of attention put on the sommelier craft from the movie. There was a lot of... Do you feel pressure for this? Because I know, frankly, like, look, you're starting off giving me a canned answer. And like, honestly, you and I lived in this shit like a war. Right. It was just like... It it was was interesting, man. Like, we had no idea what we were doing. We got together in 09. We're at the, you know, Golden Gate Bridge and you guys turn on the the camera. You're like, hey, so uh, what are you doing? And I literally had no clue. You know, fast forward what now, 12 years plus, almost 13, how all of our lives were changed and you're doing all these incredible films and about all sorts of subject matters because you're slightly talented at at making films, I think. And uh, I actually, I just surround myself with people who are smarter than me, really. (laughs) Well, you've done a good job at that. Um, But yeah, man, I'll tell you what, the the film, you know, launched a, a great online, you know, company that we launched in 2014, Psalm Select, which, you know, really was a a big blessing in my life. And uh, things wouldn't be the same without meeting you. It's interesting, you know, like we talked about, I wish I could tell uh, publicly some of the stories we've been through, but we're going to have to hold back today a little bit just because we would both be canceled. (laughs) (laughs) I'm surprised we're still out there. We're just out here in the wild right now. You know, maybe 10 years from now we could tell it. But uh, not, oh my god, it's just some I, funny stories have been there. But you know, there will be some stuff. Uh, we you can make talk it. About you today. make it sound like it's bad. It's more just no. Like, it's not. It's not it, us. Yeah. It's not us. It's others actually. <laughs> yeah. <Just kidding. laughs> oh shit. I, I, oh man. I mean, the, the whole the whole process. I think you know, look, a lot of the people who I'm trying to think how to position some because I think on this podcast, it's always a specter that kind of haunts everything. You know, it all everything came mm-hmm. from some, and then you know. The court, we got associated with the court and all this other stuff. And I think with the film itself, do you, this is a really weird question to ask. And I know that we mm-hmm. live in a really small world. You know, wine is a big, small world. Food's a bigger, small world. Do you get recognized from the film? Like, do people say like, are you the guy? Yeah, yeah, I do. You know, I've, 
you know, I've traveled quite a bit since the movie and, you know, I've been stopped in customs going into Vietnam, you know, on the streets of Vienna in some back alley. No, somebody in Vietnam, wait, hold on. It was an English guy in customs and, uh, He's like, yeah, he, he, he's like, you in Kobo by chance? And I'm like, yeah, I am. He's like, you know, kind of like, I really enjoyed going through that experience with you. I was like, well, I'm sorry you had to go through that. <laughs> but a uh, uh, really nice guy. And, um, you know, Vietnam, Mexico, you know, a lot of places. Of course, there's this this movie's been seen around the world. So a um, lot when I'm in France and Burgundy or Bordeaux, you know, because yeah. a lot of wine people have seen it. Not necessarily, you know, the farmers in different areas, but more of, you know, the agents and people at, you know, Pro Wine, for example. But it's it's great to see how the movie's impacted a lot of people and I think motivated a lot of people to get on the wine education path and change their careers to wine business and realize that they they have a passion for food and beverage, you know, and we understand why. I think that um, the whole path with the Psalm thing, I've told some of these stories before. It was not, I mean, it was the first thing I ever made. You know, it was the first thing my wife, Christina, Jackson, our, the, our whole team, we'd never made a feature film, ever. We'd never made anything that we were trying to sell or make money off of or get any other person to like besides our parents. And so when we made Psalm, we had no effing clue what we were doing. And so I think, and I've, to, I've listen, I've told this so many times publicly. When I met you, Ian, is when I knew I had a film. Because I met somebody who was... You know, you're as neurotic as I am in the right. way that like there was no backup plan. You were gonna pass that exam. I don't know what yeah. I mean, I like now I wanna ask you, why in God's green earth did you want to take that exam in the first place? Like what was the reason? I've asked you this on camera a hundred times, but now that you're like an adult, you, know, you have two kids. You know, I loved wine so much. I just wanted to learn everything about it and be able to share that with other people. And when I took the introductory exam in 2006, I saw all of these incredible professionals get up and talk about wine. And it was like they knew everything and why things they tasted the way they do, the history of different places, and be able to share these stories that, of course, now I've learned myself and traveled to these places. But it's just such an incredible aspect of life uh, for me. With like wine and food, it's pretty much my favorite pastime. And I wanted to learn as much about it as possible and share it with people. And I knew that it was going to be a good career path because there were so few people that had passed the exam at that point. I think there had been less than 150 people at that point in 2006 when I passed the exam or maybe 170. But I wanted to do something that few people had. And I was extremely passionate about, you know, the great wines of the world. I just started, you know, I got back from from India traveling and I got a job at the Wine Merchant of Beverly Hills for $14 an hour. And I basically started tasting the great wines of the world. And I just started reading about them when I got home. I couldn't barely pay my bills. And it didn't really matter because I was so stoked on wine. And I was in my mid-20s and I really had nothing else that I really wanted to do in my life. I'd studied, you know, I'd done so many things in terms of studying, you know, languages and business. And when I finally tasted wine, like a Rumier 1990 Mucini Grand Cru, I was like, I just want to drink this all the time. <laughs> you know, I just, you know, what do I have to do to be around these great wines of the world? Because it's like listening to great music. It just strikes a chord in your soul. And there's something so special about what wine does for our life. And, you know, I don't think the movie quite shows that more kind of soulful side of wine because we were trying sure. to remember flashcards and geography and blind taste and past that. But, you know, the other side of wine is so, there's so much more to, I think what the movie showed was the more stressful side of it. But, Hanging out without a camera on, without, you know, which changes people, as you know, it's different when you sit around a table of eight or 10 people and everyone's at, uh, you know, three or four glasses in and corks are popping. It's, there's, you know, and there's a bunch of pate on the table, you know, like in urine burgundy. It's just, I don't think there's many things better in life than, than drinking great wine with great people. I agree. Especially I when you understand what's in the glass. It's, like drinking great white burgundy, for example, you know. Your, your first line in the film where you basically come in and say, you know, you're transported for this time when you have this glass, that is a reason the movie starts that way. Right. And because it is one of the only moments in the film where somebody gets to say, this is why I love it. The rest of the film, and by the way, I mean, as you know, films are, you know, you live in a universe, you live in a tiny little world and there's edits and, you know, I'm not going to say the film, first of all, I stand by the film being very true as to what to happen and it probably could have been more brutal. But 
I also say that that's why I had to make a second one. You you were part of the reason I had to make a second one because mm-hmm. I had to show why you guys were crazy. I had to show yeah. what you loved. I had to do right. the, go to Shab. I had to go to DRC. I had to do mm-hmm. all these things, and you're the reason because yeah. I owed it to you. And I say right. this like with total humility and respect mm-hmm. because I didn't get to do that in the first movie. You know right. that didn't exist, and now I'm making. You know the fourth one comes out in September. I got to figure out how to get you in it. You know I'll I'll show up at your house with a truckload of weed or something, but. But like, whatever works. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, it just, it just, it changed my entire life and it made me a filmmaker in a way that was different than just declaring myself a filmmaker. The world said, okay, you made a movie. And a lot of that is because of you. But I, we got to dig into a couple things in some. And I want yep. your goddamn honest opinion here. Don't, yep. don't mess with me. The big questions I have is first of all, I want to talk about to start. That scene at the table with Dustin and Eric Railsback, who is basically a brother-in-law of yours now at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. I introduced him to my uh, my wife's little sister about ten years ago, and they're getting married this year. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Good. <laughs> I won't ask how you feel about that. And that, uh, and <laughs> no, he's uh, a good friend of mine. I love Eric yeah, though. Yeah. And 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 Dustin and all these people. I want to talk about that scene where they start ripping on you and calling you dad because I know yeah. that this has pissed you off and you've been called you know, dad a I, lot. You know, I, you know, I think it's it's just it's interesting because when the cameras were off, like I would think I was called dad maybe once, maybe twice in the entire many years <laughs> I knew everybody. And it was funny because when the cameras turned on, you know, and I show up, it was like I was at work, I think a 10 hour day and I was like, I'm not coming up. And Brian's like, you got to come up. And I was like, showed up, everyone's drunk. <laughs> and then the cameras turn on and everyone starts acting like a dick for no reason because all of these guys were my buddies, right? And it's like, when you have friends that you're hanging out with all the time, like nobody usually is a dick to you. It's like just totally abnormal. And then all or, of a sudden- Or you, you don't notice it. Maybe you're just not that sensitive to it because no, I mean, guys are, guys are no, kind of dicks to no, each other, right? But when, the, but when the cameras turned on, dude, Things changed, and it's you know. Also, and it was Eric a bit, is a certain you know, look. Eric is a know, wonderful guy, but his energy he's a he can egg yeah. people on. He's done it to me. Right. I mean, I almost right. Like, yeah. uh, oh, but oh. listen, listen. You know, all I got to say is, you know, when the cameras turned on, people's personalities changed, and you know, and it, and, it, and it kind of like was a bummer because you're like, why are you acting like this to me on film when you don't when the camera's off? And it, and it bummed me out a little bit. I'll be honest. Yeah. Well, I I honestly feel like you know it's so conflicting because that was a weird scene where like. You know, in a lot of cases when you make a documentary, you're kind of prodding people like, what are you doing? What's going on? Show me. Because you, know, you just need, you need exposition. You need people to explain what the hell is going on right now. Right. But in that scene, I remember like, you came up. I'm not joking. That was not an ambush. I was trying very much to just get B-roll of you guys tasting. You sat down and they laced into you. Yeah, I and, don't know what motivated that. I mean, that was one of the first. Um, it was very funny. Parts I'm, of not the gonna, film. I'm not well, going to lie to you that me, it is. Me, it's very. Me funny. and you had been filming for about a year, a year and a half before that, and that was one That's of right. the major, first times that I had been on film with them, and they they laid into me, and it, I don't know why, but it is what it is, you know. I, I think truly, to be honest, I mean, I, I hope I hope at this point you can look at it and laugh a little bit because it is it is funny. I mean, there's no context, by the way, that you just came from work. You know, in the context of the film, you just always wear a suit. And that's not the truth. And like, you know, all yeah. this stuff. My fondest memories of making some are you and I watching Anthony Bourdain's first show on Travel Channel late at night, 3.30, 4 in the morning. Jackson, you and I awake, you know, talking about things that I never had conversations about. Never. Because out of everybody in the movie, you and I were, and Jackson, were probably the most traveled. Yep. Him and I had gotten done doing this PBS travel show. We traveled all over, probably filmed in 20 countries together. And you were the only one I knew that had been to South Africa, had been to France, had been to Italy. I was shocked to find out how many, not just master sommelier candidates, but master sommeliers had never been to a lot of the wine regions. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. And you had been to all these places. It's part of the reason I was like, this is my guy. Yeah, thankfully, you know, I traveled a lot. Luckily, you know, I was, you know, I taught tennis and I was involved in other entrepreneurial activities in college, uh, which allowed me to have Entre- money. Entrepreneurial <laughs> activities. Should, should we elaborate on that? Or is uh, you, that know, not okay? you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all legal, legal now. now. <laughs> but yeah, but but other than that, we don't need to really get into it. But sure. um, that enabled me to travel for a year and a half through, you know, I got a job in the Dora Valley for $2 an hour um, right after I graduated college. And I ended up in North Africa for a few months and then traveled through Basically, every country in Europe ended up in... Yeah, but think, uh, think about the scene. You work for $2 yeah. an hour. That gives you perspective on what people yeah. are making to make your wine. You know, exactly. I mean, you know, exactly. you know things people don't know about this business. Yeah. I just, I want to say this because, I, I mean, you know, you and I, we've had a lot of late 
nights. We drank a lot. We've had a lot of fun. And I, yeah. I really, I, I, I say this with a, like total humility. I adore you, and I think you, you were not only my horse, but I made a big mistake making my first film is that I became deeply friends with the subjects in a movie. Mm-hmm. And it's part of the reason I've never been able to get out of this world is because I love you guys. And when, when I think about kind of all the shit we have been through, and you've been in all three films, mm-hmm. if you think there's a chance you're not appearing in Psalm 4, well, then you're <laughs> fucking crazy. It's just never going to happen. Whatever you need, brother. I'm here. I'm here. I need, I need somebody to play the president of the United States. It's going to be you. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know what I need. <laughs> but you definitely got to be in it because you, you know things through experience, and that's, that's important. But what I, what I wanted to say was, there's another scene in Psalm that I think is like probably the most talked about scene. Mm. And the one you probably, it's your fault. You've talked about it more than anybody. And that's the Reggie Norito tasting where you say the wines were switched. Yeah. And I want, I want to talk through this. Right. Because it is by far the funniest thing I have experienced in my entire life to this moment. And I don't think I'll ever experience anything funnier is your dedication to the fact that the Behringer wine that you tasted was switched. I'm going to let you have the mic. I want to talk about this. You know, it's just interesting. I, I showed up to the tasting and the person pouring the wines had changed, right? And But the same wines had been poured for the woman next to me. And it's interesting because, you know, I've been to the Hill of Hermitage and I've spent many days of my white life tasting white Hermitage and it, it's a very distinct wine. And I've been to Behringer and I sold it by the glass at the time, right? Behringer literally was my by the glass Chardonnay at the wine bar. And so when you told me, when he told me the wines were switched, it, it just did not contemplate and then I looked to Susanna Chowler for whatever reason yeah. you cut her out of the movie. I don't know why no, you she, cut her. We didn't have a camera angle on her. We had okay, no footage well you, of her. Well, maybe you, you didn't have her on. Well, I just think it's interesting that could have been talked about that she actually said, Ian, I gave her my glass. She said, no, Ian, your wines taste different than mine. Your wines have been switched. And I was like, okay, this, it's done. I, at this point, I didn't need any confirmation from anybody, including you or Reggie. I don't care. Well, on my end, you know, here's so here's the here's the interesting part. Reggie was crazy. Now, Reggie, I should say, (laughs) you know, Reggie's gone from the court, you know, involved in some issues with the court scandal of the cheating thing. I had, thankfully, I wasn't filming. I had been years since I had been By the way, you know, the day after this all came out, Fred called me and he said, God damn it, Ian, you were right the whole time, weren't you? (laughs) No fucking shit. Yeah. Are we allowed to say Fred Dame? Is that a name we're allowed to mention? Yeah. I love Fred. Okay. Uh, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but it's interesting. He was like, he was like, he was like, literally, he was like, you were right the whole time, weren't you? And I, but the thing is, if the wines well, were we weren't, poured we weren't out, allowed, of, we weren't allowed to be in there. So that I think that's the reason we didn't have a camera on Susan Chawla and who else? There was some other young right, guy. But there. don't you think it's odd that she tried my wine compared to her wine and said, "Ian, you have them poured in the wrong order." God, I got to go back to the raw footage on this. I have to like no, I, and then everyone and then everyone is like looking at it from an outside perspective, and it's like you just laugh at it because I look at the sky and I see it's blue, and everyone else is saying it's red. And you're like, all right, well, it's all good, <laughs> you know. No, but, I, but, the, but to tell you the truth, it didn't affect me because I know what I smell. And I re-poured the wine at the end of the tasting, and I poured the Beringer Chardonnay next to the wine I thought was Beringer Chardonnay, and they tasted the same. So it's yeah. like nobody can tell me that the sky is not blue when I look at. Is it. that is that a um, you are you will always be a much more uh, <laughs> accomplished taster than I will be. Is there any chance you could have? Mistaken Behringer Chardonnay for whatever what was it Jabalay? What was the white Hermitage? It was a, it was a white Hermitage. I can't remember that far, but I believe it was Jabalay. Uh, but the thing was, like, I was like, maybe I did get them wrong. Even if Susanna smelled my Hermitage with her glass, which was poured in a different order, and she said they were poured in the wrong order, so I was like, oh god, okay, this is not the color blue. So I got the actual Hermitage or the, and I confirmed it, and I said, okay, I was correct. And then you see the way the movie's edited, which you know. And they and well, no, it's, not, it's actually. But I'm it, not kidding. The movie's not manipulative. But I the truth is, this. but the truth is, like Susanna telling me, Ian, your wines are poured out of order, and that didn't make the movie. It just makes it look like it's me against Reggie, even though there was two yeah. people at the table who disagreed with Reggie. This is a scene that I would love to do. Basically, here's what I'd like to do. I would like to do a combination of the movie JFK with the third gunman in the grassy knoll, but also an idea of like how you draw X's and O's in like a sports game. Take all the raw footage, lay it out, and you edit it with me how it should look. Well, because listen, I, I think it would be interesting to actually like interview Susanna because she was there. And oh, she well, actually, 
Oh my God. The funniest part she's is on she Twitter. Like, I, I know her. she like, yeah. she, she told me, she's like, Ian, I can't believe what people think happened in that scene, which actually what really happened. So it's literally like two of us that actually smelled my wines because no but one else when, other than Reggie, he didn't even taste my wines. He literally smelled them quickly and was well, like, we got it right. But he that's, did do that. that's true. That's, he did do and, that. that's, and that was, I think, the more frustrating thing of anything is how good of a taster <laughs> is he? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I will say that when, when, when those wines were poured, part of the issue is we were short. You know, it's just Jackson and I. We didn't even have a sound guy. So like Jackson and I were outside filming whoever went before you their reaction to their tasting. And the other thing too is Dustin completely falls apart. I mean, that's like the most interesting part about that tasting is that it's sort of just everybody shit the bed, you know? But, it's, I mean, it but was, it's, uh, it's also interesting that a different person poured my flight than poured their flight. I mean, do you think there's a chance that G. Gordon Liddy was behind the Bay of Pigs invasion on this? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds listen, like it like, sounds like a conspiracy theory. No, like your, just, de- your no, dedication listen, to no, this I have, is no, my- no, I have zero <laughs> doubt in my mind, Jason. It's funny because you never tasted my wines. And I so did you not. have no idea. I didn't smell so it. You're, I didn't so taste. you're, you're, you're right. judging it based on zero no, fact. I'm judging it because I fucking love your personality. And I think yeah. you're the, like, I just, and on top of it, it's a, it's one of these, look, wine tasting as a whole. Can you name something? You love this. You live in the world of wine. Can you name something more boring than wine tasting to watch somebody do? Oh, God, I couldn't I mean, imagine. Yeah, it's very boring. So think about like us, Jackson and I, which there's an untold... St- well, I, maybe I've told it somewhere in press, but you know, when we... T- I want to say it was two weeks earlier. We were supposed to go film you. I'm going to get in trouble for telling the story. I'm going to tell it. We were supposed to... I was trying to film a master sommelier giving you guys like uh, lessons on how to do this stuff. So two weeks earlier, I drove up and I was going to film you with um, Tim Gazer. Right. And it was you, Brian, and I believe Dustin might have tasted with him too, separately. And he turned me back at the door out of nowhere. He said, yes, then turn me back. And I had to drive all the way home. I literally had, I think I had $100 and it barely got me from LA back. I mean, I literally was turned away with no money. People don't understand. This film was made with nothing. Starbucks gift cards and like no money. And so when Reggie said yes, and we went up to finally just get any scene of you guys training under an MS, I was elated. And then mm-hmm. when what happened for the film, it was like, this is great for the film. It was but cool. I never, I never yeah. expected it to become one of these scenes that A, I mean, you're probably more to blame for the mythology of the scene than anyone. Mm-hmm. And then B, for it to actually have dramatic tension because a wine tasting scenes are educational. They're not fun and they're not interesting. And trust me, I have filmed more wine tasting than anyone on the planet. And I, I challenge anybody to challenge me to that. And right. so that one particular one, we should look back at the raw footage. We should take a look. We got to get to the goddamn bot. This is a national security issue, Ian. Listen, I'll tell you what, I don't think about it because I have zero, <laughs> literally I have zero doubt. Like, But you have to understand, like when somebody tells you that the wines are switched, what do you do? You're like, man, I screwed that up. And then I just to confirm that Susanna might have been wrong, I poured a, a glass of the Behringer Chardonnay and compared it and they were the same freaking wine. Yeah, so yeah, at this yeah. point, why do I need to answer questions like 10 years later about this? It's, it's just, a, it's almost a joke to me, to be honest, that I have to yeah. actually defend my myself for oh, something not, that was I, no, I think I, it's it's at this point comical how many times i've had to answer this and, Wait, do, so uh, do yeah. people ask you about this oh no people come up and they're like i know you were right like literally like they'll come up to a tasting yeah. and be like i know you're and i was like listen i have zero doubt i i tasted the wines i know what hermitage blanc tastes like and i know what california chardonnay tastes like right one has and, and behringer and is just, a very specific thing this is not like raj's Jason, wine Jason, or something I, like that. I, I, I was serving it by the glass at the time Mm-hmm. I tasted it every day. You said I, that, and you said that in the in the thing, yeah. So I've, at this at this point, we should probably change chapters because it's 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 almost a joke at this point. Do I? I mean, how many times do I have to say, okay, Reggie? It's, do you think if the wines were switched and he knew they were, would he admit it on film? Think about that. Probably not. I would also okay. say this. Okay. I mean, look, you've got the ultimate like drop card in the fact that look, we we know what happened to Reggie, and. You know, that is uh, is what it is, you know? What are you drinking there? Uh, uh, Air Lenova Direct Import Rosé. Bubbles. Yes, Bubbles. Man, that's a great uh, bottle. Out of a, nice, uh, out of a nice white wine Zalto stem. 
you uh you are drinking what am i i'm just drinking uh some rosé right now but i wish i had uh is it is it charles shaw rosé like uh you like you like you blind tasted brian and delin and i it's actually Behringer rosé but i was told it was something different before I, I'm uh, well, you're drinking, you know, I'm, you know, it makes sense. Great, great. Time. I didn't bring this up to piss you off. I brought this up because no, I know, actually, honestly, I'm on I your am, side. I am no, really on your side. Jason, this, Jason, right? Jason, it's great to talk about, but I honestly think it's so funny how many things happened at that tasting that are like, okay, let's compare the wine to the, actually what's in the glass. And then you right, have so, somebody next to me who, who, who also agrees. You're like, all right. At this point, well, uh, we'll bring in Susanna Chawla at some point to like because this but is the like best great part. Continue, the but. best part of it all. So, like a year and a half later, I show up to the Ritz Carlton Half Moon Bay, and there was a sommelier that took over my job. And there's like ten people sitting at the wine bar, and we had a psalm sh- viewing, right? Didn't we? And yeah. so he had the whole, the whole, the whole bar was sitting there, and he pulls a bottle and blind tastes me on a wine, and I called it Behringer Private Reserve Chardonnay. And That's his right. mouth dropped and he was hoping I would call Hermitage Blanc. And so I called producer on the Chardonnay and it was classic Chardonnay. It's not like that tough, but it's oaky, yeah, yeah, it has yeah. body. That wine is so unique. That and wine it's, is very, it's very oaky too. That's the other thing. It's very it's, oaky. But, but Hermitage Blanc doesn't have oak, Jason. So why are you going to call a white Hermitage oaky California Chardonnay? That wine does not have oak. It's old, neutral barrels. So we don't need to get into the technical, but that's also, it's like, you have new oak on a white wine. You're not calling it Hermitage Blanc. Yeah, I, I, I listen, I, I, I only brought it up. Look, clearly, this is something that, that we need to... I, I'm thinking what we do is we, we drug you and we sit you down and then we we get you to talk in like a uh, in a dream state about this whole problem. No, you get this is I just think this is hilarious. I just uh, to me it's just I was there and I filmed it. And it you know what I wish, Jason? Ho- I wish yeah. you would have tasted the glasses. I wish I would have too. You said that to me afterwards, and you know what? If I didn't have to go outside and interview you and then walk because right you back would into have the zero setup, doubt if you tasted the California Chardonnay, you would have said. That's California Chardonnay. One was an older Hermitage Blanc. First of all, Hermitage Blanc is a very specific thing. It is a very specific thing. It is a... Uh, Listen, uh, you're preaching to the choir. Thank you. Yes. I, look, I didn't bring this up. <laughs> at, this point, this up at, at this point, it's comical. Like, dude, could Reggie not have tasted the freaking wines? I mean, we have, it's, like, it's, it's hilarious. But at this point, anybody who has tasted an older Hermitage Blanc to a, a younger Napa Valley Chardonnay from Behringer knows that the wines are so different. You can't yeah. mix them up. And if you do think you can mix them up, good for you. <laughs> we, I feel like there's a way to settle this. I'm not sure how, but we can settle this. You, you, you know, to, to people listening, a lot of the things I know about wine, either the seed was planted by Ian or he literally taught me with his hands. And so let's talk about, so I, I guess, you know, there's a couple more moments in the film and they're very simple. Like that moment, when you got brought into the room and told the results, there was a lot of drama outside for us because we were told seconds before we weren't allowed to film it. We were told all sorts well, of stuff. Well, just like the 2010 Meadowood, like yeah. you were locked out last second. That was a strange, I mean, we didn't start from the beginning, but there's a lot of stuff that happened at the beginning. I was there by myself with you showing up to this crazy exam. Just me with a camera. This is just me. Dude, you know? just, and we're staying in that haunted house up at Tier Valentine. Right. That's right. I mean, I mean, we my, could talk for my, three hours about. We, everything. we could talk for two weeks. My my relationship with the court has been, I wouldn't say, very fun. Honestly, I, I've gone on record before saying it was an organization I did not like working with, top to bottom. They promised things, then kicked me out of rooms, and there were all sorts of like little groups and clicks, and everybody would disagree with another. And I know Fred is Fred is basically like a name you don't utter anymore, but. Fred was like the one no, person yeah. who seemed to be able to get shit done in the organization. Right. Everybody had their own direction and opinion, which, I, by the way, now as like an adult with children, I totally get. But as a young filmmaker who was a kid at the time, I was very frustrated. I understand. I understand both sides of it. There were this side that wanted to show this incredible process to the world, and there were parts that wanted to keep it somewhat closed and, and secretive, which it, it's always been. Why? Why keep to that? it secretive? Like, what's the point of that? Because that's the way it's always been. So people don't want change. 
But look at what's happened. Like, look what happened to the organization. Yeah, but look how painful it was. I mean, <laughs> literally, I mean, there was a cheating for, for scandal. For, <laughs> there was a cheating scandal. There's the issues with all of the people who did not great things and horrible things to people. I mean, why was it so painful? I like look at the court and it's like, why did they have to make it so hard for themselves? You know, I mean, Emily is, I, I respect her to the moon. She's in Psalm 1, a wonderful, incredible person trying to pick up the pieces of this organization. Yeah. Like, why did they make it so hard? I blame Fred for this and everyone else who had any kind of say. It's their fault. I don't but. know what to say. It's just people had their perspective of how things should be run. And we showed up in 2010 with approval from half and non-approval from the other. And, you know, thankfully I passed apart. I was just focused on passing the exam. And, you know, I did really well at tasting in theory and uh, didn't pass, but passed service. And it was, I was just stoked because Fred called me. I don't know if you know, I mean, you do know this. I mean, I got... I, I got the Red Scholar at the April 2009 exam. And yep. then in December, Fred called me and said two people dropped out from the test. And this was, I think, three weeks in advance. Oh, you had like and, no, you had no notice. You, you just and so jumped like, on it. I hadn't, I hadn't been studying. You know, I'd just been kind of hanging out and drinking wine and kind of enjoying life and working. And then he told me that myself and Dustin had been invited because we were the top two scores at the April exam. And I said, Fred, I said, I really want to go into the test with a chance of passing, I don't think I should go. And he said, he said, Master Cobble, if you don't take this invitation, I'm never forgonna give you. And I was like, okay, no problem. I'll be there. And then I called <laughs> you as as we talked about. And you're like, I'm driving up. And uh, that was that was the start of it. But obviously the footage didn't, you know, work into being well, I did put a, in the film. I did a series on Psalm TV, and this is like hard to have this discussion. And it's basically so it's called the exam and it's like following you guys, but like outtake footage, but like footage, it's not like, it's not like some where it's like, you know, it's just, it's just goofball stuff. We never finished the season because the article came out that Fred and everybody, you know, what happened in New York times. I mean, Fred and <laughs> so I don't know how to end it because it was going to end with you at the top Psalm where you win that, which I didn't really get to put in the film. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful moment. And like, that's the one thing that never got to come across in the film is how just crazy, crazy. Yeah, that was a crazy few years. And then crazy Athens, few Greece, years. So intense. Athens, Greece so happened intense. after that. Yeah. And, so uh, intense. I put 120%, you know. Of oh, my, you put 250%. And, you know, and the crazy part is like, you know, not many people know I was like bit by a tick on a hike in 09 and I had Lyme disease the whole time and didn't know it. So I was trying to pass the hardest one exam in the world. I had Lyme disease and I had no do I had no idea until 2000 late 2014. That's terrible. Um, it's was, terrible you went through yeah. that. I, I you but, know what? but it's but like looking back on the stress level it's like not only was I trying to you know study and work 50 hours a week but I had I had those challenges as well but I wouldn't change a thing and because of all of that I launched a company in 2014 because I quit my job with Krug Champagne and I was at home writing about wine because I was frankly it was too much of a challenge to get out and uh and try to, you know, be in the real world. So it was a perfect path, but it's just crazy to look back on it. I think anybody who is old enough will admit life is messy, but also complete, you know? And I, and I think yep. when I look at kind of the stuff that you've had to go through, you know, the film is one thing. That's a, that's a weird curveball to have in your life. Not a lot of people have to be on camera. And it's a blessing and a curse, I'm sure. You know, you get, you know, a lot of good things, yeah, and but then, also you know, it's and tough. To see, and, yeah, and to see the way you know, certain things you lived through were edited also. But, you know, you well, see you the other side. you have to edit or else the film would be well, 1,700 well, there, hours. But. There's, there's no question about that. And you did an incredible job because you made an, an interesting movie that people love watching. And uh, But there's certain points where I'm like, God, I really wish that would have been edited or, you know, differently. But at, at this point, you know, you're the, you're the creator, you know, you're God with this footage. So uh, well, it's more like, I'm more like a Cardinal at the Vatican. I, I don't know if I would do it. Like, <laughs> I think, I think, I think um, when it came, but to, you made a great movie, uh, you know, honestly, you made a great movie. I don't like watching it for obvious reasons. Uh, I don't like I, watching it either. You know, I mean, because, you know, I, I hate seeing myself stressed out and I was having, you know, it was a challenging time in my life. So nobody really it has to relive, you know, stressful moments of their life edited down into 90 minutes. Uh, so two, but two, it's, it's, it's interesting to do that. Two so. times the film showed. One, I remember we were working on it for years and you had not taken the exam, which you ultimately passed at the end. And, you know, the film itself, like just goes from, you know, 
Brian passing, Dustin passing to like, you know, the fallout, and then basically you pass. But people that I don't know if they realized that was an entire year. We waited. Well, there was the whole, you know, I, I had to keep studying. I had the top SOM and I went on to win the Young World Championship in Greece. And I got back and I had to watch. I, th- this is the craziest part of it so all. This is like, the screen. This is the a, screening we're going to yeah. talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I sat in a movie theater like with my grandma, like and my and my cousins, my mom, my dad, and you don't you don't know like what you're going to look like, right? Because we all we all just live through life. I was and you so don't... fucking scared to show you this film, and I was no. I remember you looking. I remember you looking back at me like above you, about ten feet, like <sighs> so nervous. And, uh, and, uh, but it it was a, the, the hardest part about this whole process was watching this whole movie. And the end was when I won Top Som, but I still had to take the test in four months. Yeah, because in the original cut, and it was you my, it was my deadline. Top Som. You won Top yeah. Som at the end, which that's yeah. why we did this exam series on Som TV. But I never finished it. I'm going to. I will finish this. I have to figure out how. Am I allowed to show Fred? Is Fred like? I don't even know what to do. Of about course this. you are. Of course you are. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, Twitter would say no. <laughs> and okay, on top well, of it, I mean, you know, there are things that Fred did that I wish that I knew about. I mean, I didn't. I'm not surprised, yeah. but I didn't know. And I, I wish that I had seen it. But, you know, this is complicated and something that you and I are shouldn't, we're not qualified to adjudicate or adjudicate probably. But I guess you're right. I guess you're right. I, I don't know. I don't know. So I, I've been trying to figure out how to end that series because I want it to end because in the end, you win. And you win in Psalm too, but Psalm has a lot of like, you know, the moments that are really hard to watch yourself going. But that screening you're talking about happened at Chapman University in Orange County. Yeah. And yeah. it was a huge theater. And we only invited a certain amount of people. I will say this the podcast producer right now listening, Nadine Netman, who's a major force at Psalm TV, I met her at this event. Oh, she was there. Yeah. So I reached out to people and I was like, I need, I need an audience. I need people who are smart in wine. She wrote these incredible Somalian mystery books and she reached out to me. And so she was there and like that particular screening changed my life. There was a narrator. We had a narrator in that film that doesn't appear in the final version. It had Jay-Z music in it. There's a part where Dustin and Sabato are getting ready and they're rapping Jay-Z together and we didn't put it in the film. It's hilarious. There's so much stuff that we couldn't use because of rights issues. And, um, but that particular screen it. Well, maybe, maybe Jay-Z will pass off on it because he's seen it. <laughs> I, see, yeah, I know he has. I've seen it. No, and that's the weird thing that Sam has done. Sam yeah. has done this thing where LeBron James has tweeted, I watched Sam and X's hat, you know, and then I bought this wine and like rappers have done it. And like, so the second screening I want to talk about, aside from to close out that last one, I remember you at the end, you had tears in your eyes after the screening. People were clapping. People liked the movie. It wasn't as good as the final version, probably. But you hugged me and I hugged you and I thanked you for letting me do this. And you said to me, and I'll never forget this for the rest of my life, I could have looked so much worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and well, it's true. Honestly, I, you know, I always, I've always been an optimist and you're like, okay, there are some scenes, you know, your friends are being dicks to you, which is always tough to see because, you know, uh, I've never had that before in my no, life because I've always all, had... We've all, but we've you know, all had, we have guy you know, friends. And, I mean, guys and, are dicks. You're right. Yeah, but you know, not my usual friends. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. But uh, <laughs> other than that, um, you know, it's just it is what it is. Yeah, that's right. And then you know, seeing that seeing the scene with Reggie, you know, it was just like God, man. I look like I'm disrespecting my teacher. I feel like Luke is telling Yoda <laughs> to fuck off. You know, and it was like right, yeah. And, and you know, and I and I, that was what bothered me most is because I looked disrespectful to my teacher. At that point, Reggie was somebody really teaching me to pass the exam, like. And I had all the respect in the world. But at that point, I had all the evidence to not be on the same page yeah. for reasons that, I, <laughs> that I've that i talked about today. It makes uh, sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I, but you know, but I'm so you. coming out of it, I'm like, man, I, I I want that to be shown. Like, hey, can you interview Susanna Chalik? And is there anything that could be shown? Of course. Oh, let's um, do it. That, I'm, I can it, tell you right you know, now, that's happening. We'll do that on Sam TV immediially. I mean... That, that I mean, not it'd be interesting to, to get her perspective on it. But third gunman on the grassy knoll. With that said, you know, leaving that, we had a party at my house afterwards. We all got together. So fun. We drank 05 Ponte Cane, right? Am we I right? Drank, we drank some of the best wines I've ever had in my entire life. But, but we day. drank a bunch of crazy old wines. Yeah. And uh, I just remember like drinking a lot because I was like, man, this movie is going to be impactful. And I have to pass this flight. In July, you and had it was the like, test. and it was like March. So it's like March. It was literally four months, 
You and asked. I you it, asked me. You're yeah. like, are you gonna are you gonna film me if I pass? And I said, I, there is just like no. I, I owe nobody on this planet anything more than that. I owe you the most of anybody. I will wait as long as it takes to finish this movie. And you know what? You passing, which was just me with a camera. I was the only person in Dallas. I had to fight the court like to an inch of my life to be allowed to film you. And I didn't even film much. I just filmed you getting but we, in. But you didn't, you didn't get the results. You, we had no, to go to that, no pool, results. that pool room in the back. And I called my pops, didn't I? You called Mercedes. Yeah, that's right. Who is in the film. And I'm sure that's, you know... That, that's the weird thing about this movie is like all of you guys at a certain point in your life are in the film. And I saw it from another standpoint. And I, you know, your wife could do an entire podcast with me about what it was like to go through you taking the exam. But like, <laughs> you, should, yeah, you should, you should, I, you know, I should also say, and I'll get in trouble for this, but like, I think you're the only person still with the person in the film. <laughs> like everyone this else, is, everyone this else is, true. is not with this the person true. they were with in the movie. And God bless everybody for personal reasons for that. But I mean, it also goes to show something about you. I think um, the, the other, the other screening was the premiere in Napa. We showed this movie to a completely sold out 500 person screening. And I had a teacher who was mostly a patron at my bar, but a teacher at my film school named David S. Ward. And he wrote The Sting and wrote and directed Major League and was nominated for an Oscar for doing Sleepless in Seattle as a screenplay with Nora Ephron. He said to me after the screening, because he came up to see it, he literally came from Los Angeles this guy, this wonderful, incredible angel that has supported me my whole career, he came up and he said, I am sorry to tell you something. You're not going to like this. First time filmmakers never do. Because he made The Sting when he was 27. He wrote it, won the Oscar. And he's known for The Sting no matter what he's made, no matter what he's done. He said, you are going to be known for the rest of your life for this movie. And I didn't believe him. And now, no matter what I do, and I've made several things not to do with wine and but no matter what I do, Psalm is it. And so that screening at Napa was the one where I realized, what have we done? You know, this is for real. Like, it's a thing. And people listening to this, I want to make you sure you understand. I'm not talking about like, this isn't like some humble brag or me being like, oh, we made something great. I'm telling you, we made this film for fucking nothing. And we were at a place, we weren't at Sundance. We were not at some major festival. We were not at Tribeca. We were not somewhere where you expect things to blow up. We were at the Napa Valley Film Festival its second year. That is not a place where things like this happen. And so for this movie to do it, I, I stand before all of you with the, uh, the humility that is earned. And um, you know, for you and I, Ian, to do this on the 100th episode of the podcast and actually get into the bullshit and the weeds, it means a lot. I mean, it's, it's cathartic you know, to talk about this mm. goddamn movie. Yeah, it's been a while since I have, but... Uh... Yeah, it's an interesting thing just how life has happened and how this has affected all of our paths. And definitely, you know, at moments, you know, it's funny because the moment that I was asked to do the movie, I was like, you know, 29 years old, very passionate. I'm like, I wonder what I'll end up looking like. You know, you're like, like, what's the worst case scenario that I just look like a complete <laughs> person who's stressed out? You know, because before that in my life, I was more of a, you know, relaxed person that was good at, you know, rolling joints and drinking Chablis, you know, yeah, you're and like then, a like, Southern California yeah, guy. I yeah, mean, it's, totally. Yeah. yeah. Surfing, but like, you know, trying to pass this test, you know, you literally have to take every single piece of your soul and put it in this direction. And then, you know, I was stressed out. My body was under different stresses, like I talked about, and there's a camera in your face and the results are what they were, but I don't regret a moment of it because I've ended up in an incredible place wildly successful business that's still growing. And yeah, I mean, honestly, you've, worked your, you've worked your ass yeah. off. I mean, it's no question. It's, you know, and you know, it's proof, you know, if you do work your ass off, it'll pay off. Yeah. I believe that. That's true. I want to, I want to talk about a couple of, take a left turn here. It means a lot to go through that. that. That whole thing, I think people listening to this, you have to understand that's, this is a, Ian and I don't have these conversations very often. Sam is like this kind of very strange experience for us. We talk about it's like everything. a dream. It's like it's a like, dream now. It's it like is. literally. It's, it's like, like what the hell that, happened? Did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. What the hell happened? And so, <laughs> all right. Know. So since you left Psalm, you know, I, I wanted to ask you how much is the Master Psalm accreditation? Does that factor into your life at all anymore? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a big deal to me. I still have you know 
I think it's an incredible organization that's getting on the right track. Emily Wines is incredible, you know, Very longtime lover. friend of mine. She's she's so perfect for for the role she's in. I love Shane Bjornholm, like a brother to These me. These are all everyone charge. you've named is in Psalm One. Yeah, a, a funny a funny story about Shane. You know, because Delta was playing Psalm, and so Shane told me this story where he's in the movie and the person next to him is watching it. And he's like, you know, and he's like kind of like trying to get noticed by the person next to him. And they didn't, he was like (laughs) kind of looking at it. Like while he was in the scene, he was like waiting for that time. Like, does this person know that they're sitting next to the star in this scene? But it's pretty funny hearing (laughs) hearing Shane talk about that. But um, uh, with that said, I, I think the court has done a lot for the world of wine and I think they will continue to do so. But they've had a few hiccups along the way. And Listen, is the is the is the is the master psalm title going to be okay? I mean, does that matter? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I, um, I there's almost nobody in the wine world or food world I love more than Sabatascaria. He's somebody that I just yeah, incredible I think he's guy. a brilliant mind, a sweetheart. Never ever says anything negative about anybody, and yeah, he's, he's, he's he's on the he's, board and he cares a lot to work from inside yeah. to change. You know, he's not only a great sommelier and person and friend, but he's one of the greatest operators and, and businessmen you'll meet. So Hands having up. him on the inside is amazing. Now, I should quickly tell a story really fast, though, you sons of bitches. When I was <laughs> filming, and I was like, you know, when you, when you film somebody, you have to be up two hours earlier than them. You have to go to sleep an hour later. So you, you sleep, and when you're trying to do that with Ian, that means you don't sleep at all. So Well, I would get home. I, I would get off work at 11, right? i get home at midnight. And We'd stay up till three thirty. Yeah, and you know it was just the way that worked. Like people know that when they're listening to this, a lot of people are working restaurants. You get off work at eleven, you get home at midnight. It's like most people six thirty p.m. That's like, true. No, it really is true. You your know, brain, yeah, your brain's like, reset. Like I, you can't just come home and turn off the lights and go to bed. You know, you come home and you pour yourself a cocktail, or in my case, I might had a glass of tea or. Whatever. I would usually drink and steady, actually. You know, not too much. I would get to like, like a nice 0.05, you know, and uh, <laughs> have some canola fetish feel. And just, <laughs> yeah, literally. It's like, you know, 0.05 after work, you know, and just relax. studying. You know, and alcohol is slightly motivating sometimes after a 12-hour day. Yeah, have well, a couple the, glasses perfect, of wine. the perfect yeah. amount. You don't want too much. I mean, as somebody who, no. you know, you, you just like a yeah. little bit. A 0.12. It's too a much, right? One, two. Yes. It's a little too much. You want to be much, like, yeah. you want to be a little, you, you should still be able to drive, you know, and then you can trace maps finally. <laughs> oh my God, that trait. We, we, we didn't even have time for the map tracing scene. It's like my favorite scene in the whole movie. So Sabato and, and Dustin, who I did not know, do you remember when you called me and I was at the house at, um, we were at Cardinal Vineyard and you called me and I was staying for your first exam, which does not appear in the film, but does appear in this series, the exam. And you said, I need a ride home. And I came and picked you guys up. And it was two in the morning. You guys were, I will say, not sober. And I met Dustin this night. I met Sabato this night. And I made you guys breakfast oh sandwiches my God. in the microwave. We were extremely intoxicated that night. <laughs> I was trying to be gentle, but yeah. You were, uh, yeah. No, you I remember. Where, where were we? Where you were guys we? were at some bar. And the crazy part is just like nothing open in like Santa We might Elena. have been at Ponches. I think we are at Ponches, no? Were we at Ponches? Ponches sounds Yonkville? right. All I know is I was like up trying to organize footage and whatever else. And, and then but the exam I, was done, right? That was... It was done. Oh, yeah. was it? Or else we wouldn't have gotten that drunk, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, it must have been done. But I don't think yeah. you had gotten results yet. I don't, um, usually you get results at the end no, of yeah, the you third had. day. And then I, so, yeah, no, 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 you're right. You're right. So I'm pretty I was sure organizing I found footage. Out, yeah. It was the end. Yeah. And I, and I pick you guys up and I, the weirdest thing in the world in the fridge, there were eggs and there was like some cheese tray that they left in the hotel that was all dried up because like it had been out for like eight hours, but there was no stove in this winery house. So you guys got home, you were all starving. And I, I made you, I'm stone sober at this point. It's late at night. I made you guys all And we break. went to the Terra Valentine house up the hill? No, this was at Cardinal. It was the second okay, way. Okay, okay, got it. Got and it, got so it, got I it. made you guys breakfast sandwiches out of the ingredients I had. And I met Dustin for the first time that night. I've never seen someone so happy. He acted like I was Thomas Keller at the French Laundry, handing him this shitty ass dried toast, egg in a microwave, 
like glossed over brie that had been sitting out for the entire day. D- 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 Dustin, <laughs> Dustin is one of the most happiest uh, is. drunks you've ever seen. You know, he's a, a, obviously a great guy, and, uh, a very kind soul. But when he drinks, he he likes to rap Jay Z. A, yes, he does. And B, he's just happy and just which wants I to have footage people. of. I have footage yeah. of. Um, <laughs> and this has never been used for anything that needs to come to light. But it was Sabato, him, and you. And you guys came in like a hurric- like a wrecking ball. And and it was uh, it was an amazing thing where I realized, like, holy shit, like these stories are everybody that's been a part of my life since then. I mean, I talked to Sabato yesterday on the phone. The guy's like one of my favorite human beings on the planet. He's amazing. I met all these guys because of you. And like, you know, Brian McClintock introduced me to you. But from yeah, that point Because on, you guys worked at a restaurant together. You no, know, right? he worked at a restaurant nearby and ended up in somebody's garage drinking with me after work. So I was bartending. Got it. He was serving uh, at Morton's Steakhouse. Okay. I mean, the way this happened is so it's so ephemeral and natural and weird that like you can't come up with this any other way. You know, there's no other way to do it. And so and to think about how many, you know, lives have been impacted from watching this film, it's it's amazing how many people I meet that have changed their lives because of this. I mean, it's it, I'm not like I'm not scratching our balls here. I'm trying what I'm trying to say is like this was an experience that we went through and when we did it, it was like is anybody going to give a shit? So like now yeah. you look back and you're like, "Oh cool, we made this thing and it was successful." Now we judge successful by a lot of people having seen it, not like it's like, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, it's not like we made a ton of money, but we were in this like, now it's been seen, but then we were nothing. And that was the fun part about this whole process is like the idiocy of being kids. And that's what this film was. We were all kids when we made it. Mm-hmm. We spent more time on Psalm than I intended to. I just, this is like, I've been waiting for a long time to have this conversation with you and it's good that we do it here. I wanted to ask a weird question. Can you think of some crazy wines, some really interesting wines you've had between Psalm and now? Because you were in Psalm 2, you were in Psalm 3. Mm-hmm. But like, I want to talk about wine for just, let's just do five minutes of wine. Because this is your passion. You love it. And it, you started a whole business off of this. And I want to know, what is it? I don't mean we have to get into like some crazy expensive stuff or anything. But I want to know what it is that motivates you. People listening would love to know what you drink. And what are the bottles you know, that keep making you? This is a this can be a brutal business. Am I not wrong yeah. on this? Yeah, what, yeah. What keeps you logistically in it? and operationally? I mean, you know, honestly, like, what do I drink a lot now? Yeah, I love to drink mezcal. Is that an okay answer? I do too. <laughs> Fuck yeah, man, I love mezcal. I think mezcal um, but, is one you know, of the. I, I don't like to publicize it because it actually is a really, really rare. You know, some yeah. of the some of the great stuff, the pachugas, and the, you know all that stuff. It's not, there's not a ton of it. You should do an episode on it. I'm terrified. We almost made some, we almost made some, God, you asked my wife about this. We almost made some two or three about Mezcal. And oh, wow. she still wants to make a film about Mezcal. She loves it. And, and it's, a, it's an incredible beverage with an incredible story. Well, to go to wine, like what excites me, Austrian white wine. I love the Vakao. I uh, love Gruner Veltliner. I love Riesling. I love dry Riesling from all over Germany as well, Alsace. But, you know, my go-to you know, Desert Island beverage is white burgundy. It always has been. The wines from Pouligny Monarche and Merceau, you know, Rouleau, Costery, Jacques Carrion. You introduced those, me, you, you know, introduced Ramenet, me to you know. Merceau. I mean, you were the one who like literally taught me about Merceau. And I remember yeah. being at, you know, several of the like single vineyards in Merceau that you love. And Jackson and I did a toast to you there, believe it or not, because white burgundy yeah, is hard to get drank, a hold of. I think we drank, you know, some Domaine La Flave Merceau, if I remember correctly. It was some Claude yeah, you know, that you, you, know, you introduced me to. Okay. Probably Corsell or something at that point. But you listen, Burgundy is my jam. That's what I love to drink. So you're still where you were. I mean, it's still your, you haven't you changed. You know, it's hard, it's hard to get out, you know, Champagne, Loire, Burgundy, Northern Rhone, Dry German, Riesling, Austrian Whites. I mean, that's kind of like my jam. I love Great, you know, Barolo and Barbaresco, Montevertine. I mean, Jesus, uh, of course, know, Montevertine you know, is great. Uh, from Tuscany. But, but you know, I, I also like to drink, you know, great Napa wine, like Old Dominus and Old Frog's Leap. Those wines are incredible wines. People who are respecting farming, people who are removing carcinogenic compounds from our farming practices, yeah. I think it's important, you know, and that's a big part about Psalm Select is, you know, trying to support farmers who are making things that are designed to be ingested in the human body. I mean, I don't think... 
we should be drinking Roundup personally. <laughs> Let's, no, I, I completely fucking agree. Not that Let's, we need to get into dirty farming, but okay. Um, I want to talk uh, two two yeah. things. I want to talk about Tom Select, but before we talk about Tom Select, we we have to plug what is probably one of the great. I'm going to say wine club is a generic term. It's not a wine club, yeah. but it is, but yeah. it's not. But one of the great wine experiences in the country is Tom Select. So everybody listening, if you've not heard of it, go to SomSelect.com and definitely do that. I'm going to let you talk about what that is for a few seconds. But prior, what what am I holding in my hand here? Uh, some flashcards that I probably have forgotten what's on them. I have all of your flashcards from Psalm 1 that you gave me at the end of Psalm 1. And I, I think didn't they're... Sell, I didn't sell them to you. Why would just you kidding. sell them? I mean, just, <laughs> at that just point, I mean... All right, so I'm going to ask you, after you talk about... I'm going to randomly pick some cards and see if you know the answers to the questions you wrote yourself for the MS exam 10 years ago. <laughs> it's too good. I can't fucking believe it. But first, tell me about Psalm Select, and then I'm going to lace into you with these cards. Uh, all right. Well, Psalm Select in 2014, we launched um, a company. There was a, a lot of people doing like daily offers, 70% off a $100 bottle of cab that tastes like a $20 bottle of cab, you know, and just skewing severe discounts of leftover inventory. We were like, what if we turn that on its head? What if we take the best wines of the world and offer them what they should be offered for and do a daily offer and do a story almost like a tableside chat of the people, the place, the history, the soils, how the wine was made, what the tasting notes are, and a food and wine pairing. Just like if somebody came to your table at a Michelin star restaurant and they talked to you for a minute, what are they telling you about? How do people bring what you're drinking in your glass alive and make you appreciate it more? Because if you're a lawyer in New York City that just got off a 14-hour shift and somebody pours you a glass of Marisol Coastery and you don't and you're just given the glass, it, it might bring you pleasure. But if somebody speaks for three or four minutes about how important these vines are, the age of the vines, or Domaine Loire, for example, one of my favorite yeah, um, producers great. in the world. I don't like, get I don't get like, to drink it off. Like, do you? Uh you know, a few times a year, but they're these are rarities. It's like, you know, so special. Like three vines make one bottle of wine, 120-year-old vines that you know, are dry farmed and the, and the roots go down 130 feet into the earth extracting the terroir of Burgundy. But if people can bring this to life, and that's the goal of Psalm Select, we would do a daily offer on small production wines and include free shipping on, say, $125. And sometimes sometimes um, these wines have age. I mean, like you actually yeah. offer wines with real age. Back to, to the 50s, you know, yeah. I think 59, 59 River Salt might be the oldest. No, we actually did an 1894 Madeira. God damn it. If you're going to do wine, like Madeira's from the 1800s, please, will you let me know? I'm on the mailing getting, list, but I'm very busy. Just, just, I'm extremely oh, well, busy. Uh, listen, you, you know, <laughs> go cry me a river. Just check your email. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, so, I like, but I bet I don't check my email. Yeah, so. I know. I was going to say, <laughs> you're, 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 I'm the worst. I'm the pot, worst. Pot meat, pot meat kettle. But you are, you're, you, what you've done is tremendous. And I think, um, but you know, wine clubs are growing. You know, we have a, my father-in-law right? probably spends twenty grand a year at some select. Well, I'll bring him up. Uh, I'll I'll bring him to lunch. You should join. But uh, you know, our biggest our biggest part of our company right now is something called the Explore Four. Ninety nine dollars for four bottles. David Lynch writes the notes. He's author great. Vino Taliano. He's one of our greatest assets in our business. We have an incredible team. We have a private client services division that you know gets you the finest and rarest wines of the world. Old DRC, old Costa Rica, old Domaine Laflave, whatever you want. And other than that, that's, you know, thankfully I have a, a great team that helps support my lifestyle because, you know, I want to focus on curating wine. And, and now we have a team that does a lot of the heavy lifting that I used to do for the first five or six years. Yeah. We're in year seven now. So, yeah, it's amazing. It's incredible. I, I, that's great. I just wanted people to be able to hear what the hell you do now. I think a lot of people do know because it's, you're out there, you've done a good job with it. All right, now now it's my time. I'm gonna yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, I'm gonna reach. I'm gonna reach in here and I'm gonna pull any flashcard. Let me try to find one. Okay. I now here's the great part about these flashcards. They're a snapshot in time that probably are wrong. Now there's a potential that there's like whole new things as far as the answers go. All Dude, right. these are 12 years old. Like this I, is dated. I, this card is dated 11 15 00. So 11 15 to. No, oh that's God. impossible. No, that's what it says. I don't believe that that's right. 
I think it's supposed to say 2010. I think you did it wrong. I it was probably four in the morning. (laughs) Dude, I found a lot of yeah. I found a lot of these where you have like no answer on the back, and I know that's one moment in Psalm where you're like, there's no answer on this one. Uh, That's hilarious. Okay, all right, here you go. Name the AVAs for Oregon. Oh, they're so different now. Oh God, there's only five answers on this. Uh, Yeah, the 2010 uh, AVAs. Okay, all right. 2010, it was McMinnville. Dundee Hills, Yola Amity Hills. No, uh, you've named several that are not on uh, here. <laughs> oh, they've all changed. And then you have Chehalem Mountains. I mean, nope. there's so many now. What are you talking about? They're not here's, there? Here's what it says. Columbia Valley, Rogue oh, Valley. Of, of Oregon, sorry. Not Willamette Valley. Yeah, not Willamette. Of well, Oregon. I mean, oh wait, you're, you were going to get into just Willamette. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Willamette is on here. That's number five. No, sorry. I, I misunderstood. So talk about... The first part about passing the master's exam is listening to the fucking question, which obviously I didn't. <laughs> but it's funny because I was just in Oregon last week and somebody asked us like name the AVAs of Oregon and now there's like 17. Oh, it's so, that's why this is so funny to go through like old flashcards. But I would say Applegate Valley, Rogue Valley, Willamette Valley. Uh, there's probably... Um, Applegate is not on it. Yeah, Col- yeah, Columbia Valley and Walla that, Walla. I mean, those would have been there, but Applegate might have happened later. Columbia, Rogue, um, Umqua? Umqua, right, Umqua, yeah. Walla Walla, Willamette. Yeah, lots of... T- <laughs> that gets things more interesting. Could you name... Oh my God, you know, this is so great. In 2011, what were the laws in this area? So you have to... Know. Oh, this is great. No, this is a really hard question. I like this. And it also has something to do with where I'm from. Name two AVAs that cover three states. Oh boy. Oh man. Uh, Walla Walla Valley. You have two of them in here. Two answers. There's probably more, but no. Walla Walla Valley, Columbia. There's one Snake River Valley might cover Idaho nope. and nope. Um, three states. This is a hard question. This is a really oh, so, I just oh, ran three, away. three, three you, separate you, states. You guys, you, you listeners, you have to understand there's hundreds and hundreds of cards like this in here. This guy obsessively had to study hundreds, probably thousands of cards that are like this insanity. But the test is even harder today, by the way. Name two AVAs that cover three states. Uh, do you want me two to tell you? Two AVAs that only, cover three states. There's only two answers on the back. Okay, it's got to be... Man. If you get one, uh, you get on, a Scooby hold, snack. Hold on. It's funny. You wrote this with your own hands just like I mean, 13 <laughs> years ago. Shenandoah Valley? I mean... Oh. Uh, I can't right, even... So, I don't remember. Right, I remember here you that. go. Lake Erie, it covers New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Oh, wow. Ohio River Valley, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky. How do you feel about that? That's such a meaningless question. I mean, I can't even. Do you need to know that to go about your day life? <laughs> no, no. Am All I right. upset that I missed that oh question? God. Not one bit. I literally just picked up a card that literally says, how is Sherry made? I'm not going to have you do that. <laughs> uh, do you want to, can I have 45 minutes? Uh, no, I was going to say that's like a whole, like eight L- podcasts. Let, let's go to, let's go to. By the way, your spin. handwriting, your handwriting is beautiful. I'm not gonna what lie to you. are you talking about? It's absolutely horrific. It's got some decent. I mean, it's got a very nice penmanship. Okay, you ready? Dude, you have. I don't trust your opinion on anything now. I believe you, and you shouldn't. <laughs> All right. So this is dated 11 years ago. 12, oh no, I'm sorry. 13. Name two appellations of Mendocino. There are eight answers on the back. Of this. Oh my God. Okay. AVAs well, I mean, of Mendocino. Uh, let's try to name most of them. I mean, you have Cole Ranch. Uh, you have Potter Valley. You have Anderson Valley. You have you, Mendocino you, Ridge. Um, you have named all these are correct so and then far. You have and uh, you only needed two. You've crushed it. Yorkville Highlands. You've yep. got uh, uh, in the north. I think there might be Laytonville that just passed. <laughs> it's not um, on here, but man, you're. That's I don't good. know. That might not be right, but you know, there's there's a number of them now. Um, yeah. All right. This is going to be. This is so good because major spoiler alert. This has a lot to do with Cup of Salvation, our film coming out. Can you name any growing regions of the Dominican Republic? No. You wrote this. I know. I, I don't remember. Santiago de los Caballeros, Caballeros, and then Chibao. But there is a <laughs> long note. There is a long note that you have put in here that there is an exception for something. Oh, my dear God. I have no recollection. We filmed in Dominican Republic for... I, ze- I literally for, uh, have zero recollection of anything involving... Shit. Some of these are not a simple question. They are like a novel on the back of this card that I don't know how the hell you would have possibly had an answer for any of this stuff. Okay, here we go. Well, it's more of like your understanding. Like they point a laser at a place in the world and ask you a question. So 
if you don't know it up and down and backwards and the producers and the soil type and the grapes, you might as well not show up to the test. Listeners, I cannot explain to you how some of these are like so hard to read because they are so, they're so detailed and so deep as far as like what the actual question is. That it's not a question. Um, okay. What are the wine districts of the Atacama viticultural region? Oh, man. There are two answers. Uh, Casablanca Valley. Um, no. No, hold on. At- I, Did you say Atacama? Sorry. Or a- a- I said, Aconcagua. I said Atacama. 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 Oh, okay. Which is okay. Like, That's in the north. That, I got it. I got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's Coquimbo. No? It's really close. Co- you're close. Pronunciation is just different. C-O-Q-I-M-B-O? No. Oh, there There's might not, be now. This is, by the way, this is dated 12 years ago. It's not like Elki and Lamari and Chihuahua. I mean, it's been a long time. Wasco, H U A S C O. Yeah, and Chiapo. Yeah, and Chiapo. Yeah, yeah, Chiapo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You got one of the. <laughs> Wine districts of the Atacama Viticultural Region. You know what? Like, there's not there's a lot that's going on down in Chile now. So, but it you know it takes you two or three hours to remember this stuff, and that's you know before you take the test, you have to re- like look at every flashcard. And as Sabato said, you have to get it into your frontal lobe. That's what he, that was his <laughs> thing, and you'd have to read every. Within seven days, you got to get this in the front. All right, of this your is brain, for all the money. If, if you get this right, I won't ask you any more. We're done. Okay. 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 What is the recipe? Oh my God. What is the recipe in Chianti other than Classico? This is what you wrote. That is a the very, recipe. It says literally, what is the recipe in Chianti other than Classico? I don't know what that means. I think it's asking how many answers what, are there? It, what is, oh my God. You, you, I, you actually do know this, believe it or not. I think they've changed the law though. The so this is not a fair one. Of Chianti. No, it means what is in Chianti, but not in Classico. So like to oh. be called to be called a Chianti, it's definitely yeah. you you worded this very confusing. Yeah. This is partly why you're probably, you know, have had therapy for years. Uh-huh. Uh, let me think. <laughs> so what is in Chianti? So if I'm gonna call a wine Chianti, what has to be in it? Okay, now, well this, it can't be. I, I well, really it, do actually think they changed this it, law. Chianti Classico cannot be hundred percent Sangiovese. So but there's also um other than oh, Classico, man. not Classico, Chianti. Not Classico. What goes in Chianti, but not Classico? Colorino. Uh, no, that's that's also. I don't know. I can. I wasn't very smart back then. I guess you were definitely smart. Here's your answer. <laughs> it has to be seventy-five to ninety percent Sangiovese, yeah. plus the possibility of five to ten percent uh, Caniolo, right. uh, yeah. five to ten Trebbiano or Malvasia, and ten percent max Cabernet. I mean, yeah. imagine to have to know this. Shit. You get another one you, until you get something completely right. We can't stop. We free. might be here all day. No, no, no. That's not true. On top of it, too, people who are actually studying for exams know that this stuff changes nonstop. Okay. And most of that stuff's probably wrong right now. No, this this is a good one. This is a simple question. No, it's mm-hmm. not. Holy shit. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want an easy question. Okay. Where was the earliest wine in North America? Uh, that was uh, it's so, in I Mexico. Never, I would never that's have in, gotten this. It's that's also, in, I don't well, think this Cos, is right. Cosimit, Cosimidero. According to what we have in, in, in the next Psalm film, this is not correct. It says that it would have been in what's now Jacksonville, Monterey. Florida. But I can tell you this right now. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was Cosimidero in it Monterey, It says Mexico. that it was made using native uh, Scapiano grapes, but I can tell you this right now. Dude, that's so funny. That's not right. I don't remember. There that. are so many cards in here. What is Pisco? You can get this. I mean, it's Muscat that's distilled. It's fermented and distilled uh, Muscat d'Alexandria grown in the Atacama Desert between northern Chile and southern Peru. Distilled into what? It's a it's a al- distilled uh, liquor. It's distilled alcohol. Uh, distilled into like an 80 proof uh, eau de vie, basically. In okay, a way. you got it. Okay, that's good. You're free. Pisco is that. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. And if you talk to anybody from Peru, it's a Peruvian. And if you talk to anybody talk to from Chile, Chile yeah. it's Chilean. Yeah. I know. I've been and, there you know, so and, many times. And, and Pisco Sours are awesome when you're there. But, you know, when's the last really time you had a Pisco Sour? Yeah. And it went Santiago probably in like 2004. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, actually, I probably had a few. I think I was invited to a, a Pisco event when they were releasing some new Pisco in, in San Francisco. and drank like seven of them one night, you know. Ian, can I ask you a personal question? No. What are the crews of Beaujolais? Uh, okay. Julienas, 
uh, Moulin Avant, Renier, hmm. Chanas, uh, Fleury, Morgon, uh, Chouilly, Cote de Bury. Uh, I think, did I nail them all? I think you got them. There's 10. You're in a good place. <laughs> I'm so sorry to do this to you, Ian. I love you so much. It means so much to have you on the 100th episode of this podcast. Thank you for letting me berate you. Yeah. You guys, everybody, go to somselect.com. This guy's working his butt off. And on top of it, too, I think uh, this is something everybody who's attained Master Sommelier should have to be put under the gun. Actually, answer the questions. Not today. Answer the questions from when you passed. <laughs> <laughs> that is the hardest Dude, thing. I can't believe I wrote those. I mean, talk about remembering stupid minutia that doesn't matter. But you know, the thing was, that's what you have to do. You just have to cover every single possible question because most people pass the test by like four or five questions or miss it by four or five questions, if not less, I think. So if you forget to study like Mexican sub-districts or something. Like, <laughs> you're probably going to get that asked that question and fail. But uh, the test is tough these days. I mean, I'll tell you what, to get through, it's always been tough relative to the times, honestly. And if you took it in the 80s or the 90s or the 2000s, it was relative to the time, what's on the shelves. And there's a reason why the title's respected. You're the best, dude. I mean it. I mean it very much. You and right your family on, are great. I miss you very much. I look forward to conning you into Psalm 4, which comes out in September. So We'll come up. Let's drink some mezcal. I look forward to it. All right, you be <laughs> safe, bud. <laughs> Later, buddy. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Don't forget, Psalm TV is $49.99 for an entire year. I also want to remind you, February 15th, we are dropping a feature film called Saving the Restaurant. Please, we want to know what you think. And one last favor. It's the 100th episode. When you're done listening, do you mind going to the platform you listen to this podcast on and giving us a good rating? Write a nice review. We read those. It means a lot. All right. This podcast was mixed by Alex McCourt, produced by Nadine Netman. Here's to another hundred. Be safe, everybody.